Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to part one of topic 3.3.2 gas exchange from the AQA A level biology specification. So the specification wants us to have a look at adaptations of various gas exchange surfaces, including the surfaces of single celled organisms, the insect tracheal system, the gills of fish and the leaves of dicotyledonous plants. Then the spec also wants us to look at the structural and functional compromises between having efficient gas exchange whilst limiting water loss with a focus on terrestrial insects and xerophytic plants. This is what we'll look at in part one. In part two, we'll then move on to the structure of the human gas exchange system, the essential features of the alveolar epithelium and how this is adapted for efficient gas exchange, and then finally, the antagonistic interaction between the external and internal intercostal muscles, as well as the role of the diaphragm in facilitating ventilation. So let's start off with single-celled organisms and how they are adapted for efficient gas exchange. Single-celled organisms have a large surface area to volume ratio, as well as a thin cell surface membrane, which provides a short diffusion path. Therefore, gas exchange can take place by diffusion across the surface of the single-celled organism, and therefore no gas exchange system is needed. Next we have insects. Gas exchange in insects relies on something called the tracheal system. The tracheal system is a series of tubes that supply respiring cells with oxygen directly. By pumping the abdomen, air is drawn in and out of the tracheae. This maintains a favourable concentration gradient for the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of respiring cells. Air enters the tracheae through pores on the surface of the insect called spiracles. Oxygen diffuses down a concentration gradient towards the respiring cells. The tracheae branch off into tracheoles, which have thin, permeable walls that border respiring cells. Oxygen then diffuses from the tracheoles directly into the respiring cells. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the respiring cells towards the spiracles down its concentration gradient and is then released into the atmosphere. So how do insects minimise water loss to the surroundings? First of all, the spiracles can be closed to prevent water loss. The drying out of a living organism, by the way, is known as desiccation, which is a key term to know for exams. Furthermore, there are hairs around the spiracles which trap humid air, creating a low concentration gradient of water vapour between inside the insect and just outside the spiracles, reducing the rate of diffusion of water vapour out of the spiracles and therefore reducing the risk of desiccation. There are also air sacs around the tracheae to provide an extra supply of oxygen if the spiracles have to be closed for a longer period of time for some reason. Insects can't be bigger as the tracheal system wouldn't be able to meet the organism's oxygen demand. This is because a bigger organism would require more oxygen due to the presence of a larger number of cells which all need oxygen for aerobic respiration, yet the diffusion distances would be much larger and therefore it would take far too long for oxygen to reach respiring cells by diffusion. Next we'll move on to how the gills of fish are adapted for efficient gas exchange. In an aquatic environment, an efficient gas exchange system is vital. This is because there is a much lower concentration of oxygen in water than in air, and the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide is much slower as well. Therefore, fish have gills, which are gas exchange organs adapted to overcoming these problems. Fish open their mouths and allow water to flow through the gills and out via the operculum, which is the cover of the gills. So how are gills adapted? First of all, each gill is made of lots of thin plates called gill filaments, which give a large surface area for gas exchange. Each gill filament is covered in lots of lamellae, which increases the surface area even more. Second, the surface of the lamellae is only one cell thick, which provides a short diffusion path for oxygen and carbon dioxide. The lamellae also have a good blood supply due to the presence of lots of blood capillaries, which maintains a favourable concentration gradient for the diffusion of gases into and out of the blood. Finally, fish have something called the countercurrent system. In the countercurrent system, blood flows through the lamellae in the opposite direction to the flow of water. 
This maintains a favorable concentration gradient of oxygen between the water and the blood across the entire length of the gill lamellae. By the way, this is really important to include in your response in exams, that it is across the entire length of the gill lamellae. Therefore, the concentration of oxygen in the water is always higher than that in the blood. And therefore, as much oxygen as possible diffuses from the water into the blood. Finally, the specification wants us to look at how the leaves of dicotyledonous plants are adapted for efficient gas exchange. Note that most photosynthesis takes place in the palisade mesophyll cells as these receive the most sunlight. Therefore, they contain lots of chloroplasts. The upper epidermis protects internal tissues from mechanical damage and the invasion of bacteria and fungi. So how are these leaves adapted? Stomata allow the diffusion of gases into and out of the leaf. The presence of many stomata means that a single cell is not far from one, which creates a short diffusion distance for gases to and from cells. Air spaces within the leaf allow the fast diffusion of gases directly to and from cells. And finally, the leaf has a large surface area which also increases the rate of diffusion. The specification, however, not only wants us to consider how leaves are adapted to maximise the rate of diffusion of gases, but also make sure that not too much water is lost as well. Plants control water loss by regulating the opening and closing of stomata by guard cells. This is affected by three factors, light intensity, water availability, and the concentration of carbon dioxide. If water is plentiful, water moves into the guard cells by osmosis due to a less negative water potential outside of the guard cells. This causes the guard cells to become turgid as they fill up with water. The inelastic inner wall of the guard cells causes them to curve, meaning that the stomata open. If water is scarce, the opposite happens. Water moves out of the guard cells by osmosis. The guard cells become flaccid, which means that they shrink back again and the stomata close. Note that at night, the stomata close as the cells cannot photosynthesize, so there's no need for carbon dioxide and oxygen to diffuse into and out of the leaf, and therefore closing the stomata helps prevent unnecessary water loss. Leaves also have a waxy cuticle on their surface, which reduces the evaporation of water from the surface of the leaf. Finally, we'll have a look at the adaptations of xerophytic plants, which are plants that live in warm, dry and windy conditions. First of all, the stomata are sunk in pits, which trap moist air. This reduces the concentration gradient of water vapour between the leaf and the air outside the stomata, reducing the rate of diffusion of water vapour out of the leaf. Hairs on the epidermis trap humid air, which has the same effect. The fact that leaves are curled with stomata inside means that the inside of the leaf is protected from the wind, which prevents moist air from being blown away. Again, this reduces the concentration gradient of water vapour between inside and outside of the leaf. 
Xerophytic plants have a reduced number of stomata, resulting in fewer places for water vapour to diffuse out of the leaf. They also have a waxy, waterproof cuticle on their leaves and stems, but take care in exams as this is not an adaptation of xerophytes specifically, as the surfaces of many other plants also have waxy cuticles. So if the question asks for adaptations of xerophytic plants specifically, do not include this feature in your answer. Great, so now we've covered single-celled organisms, gas exchange in insects, the gills of fish, and the leaves of dicotyledonous plants, whilst also looking at how water loss and the risk of desiccation is minimized. Yo, thanks guys for watching. That's the end of part one of 3.3.2 gas exchange. To watch part two, just follow the link bottom left. Adios.